Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for a special episode dedicated to my neck of the woods in New Brunswick, the Willowstook, also known as the St. John River. My name is Jessica Curry, and I'm a specialist of science, knowledge, and innovation at WWF Canada. In practice, that means I do a lot of research and data analysis to ensure that our conservation work has the greatest possible impact. I've analyzed trends in wildlife abundance, I've evaluated our protected areas network, and most recently, I helped to develop an action plan to recover species at risk within the St. John River watershed, which I'm sure you can guess is something we'll be discussing later on. Today, I'll be joined by my colleagues, Simon Mitchell and Emily Giles, as well as some of our conservation partners, including a project manager from the watershed and a postdoctoral fellow from the University of British Columbia. So let's get started. Biodiversity loss is occurring around the world. We've seen the big headlines in the news, and we've seen those big scientific reports to kind of back up those headlines. And unfortunately, Canada is not immune to these losses. We know from our most recent Living Planet report for Canada that populations of species assessed as at risk have declined by 59% from 1970 to 2016. And while these losses are occurring across the country, they're also happening right here at home for me within the St. John River watershed. And importantly, we do have processes in place to address wildlife loss. But like many other things, species recovery is often plagued by a variety of different factors, including process delays, a lack of implementation, and insufficient funding. So that really brings us to our focus of today's episode. Collectively, we need to be shifting our approach to how we're recovering species at risk in Canada, including a prioritized approach to how environmental resources are being spent to ensure that we're achieving the greatest benefits for wildlife. As we move throughout the episode today, please feel free to ask questions. You can comment in the comment boxes on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're joining us from, and we'll be happy to answer those as we move along. And before we kind of dig into this new approach for the region, I thought it would be useful to have Simon join us to share a little bit of love for the holistic. Hi, Simon, how's it going? Great, Jessica, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, so Simon also lives in the SJR. He's technically just a paddle away, but I suppose it's a long paddle because you're not relatively close. Um, but I thought it could be helpful if he shared a couple of interesting facts about the region. So. Simon, take it away. Yeah. Tell us what you know. Thanks, Jessica. It, uh, it is a bit of a paddle, and uh, I guess nowadays it would be a good long skate. Um, everything is uh, <laughs> is frozen up here. But yes, what a beautiful place we are fortunate to uh, to live and work in. Uh, the Woolastook uh, watershed has been inhabited by the Woolastookweok, the Maliseet, the people of the Good and Bountiful River for uh, well over 10,000 years at this point. And we have a very long and rich history. Um, at this point in time, the watershed is covered by uh, three jurisdictions, um, the province of New Brunswick, uh, the province of Quebec, and the state of uh, Maine, as well as uh, obviously two federal governments in the US and uh, Canada. It is home to about 500,000 people um, spread out through predominantly a rural landscape that is everything from pastoral fields in the lower river and the estuary area uh, to the highlands in, in central northern New Brunswick um, with New Brunswick's highest point at uh, Mount Carleton. And we are fortunate that um, it is connected to the Bay of Fundy. And really those two systems uh, rely on one another as the health of the river goes, uh, the health of the bay and, and the Gulf of Maine coast for that matter, and uh, vice versa. So spectacular spot, um, many rare and endangered species and just a fortunate place to uh, to live and work. Definitely. And you have mentioned that people have been living here for millennia, but I think it's important to note that there is a long history of colonial settlement here as well. Um, presumably meaning that there's been a lot of human pressures that have been affecting the region over the long term. So I was wondering if you could describe some of the key threats that have been identified through WWF Canada's watershed reports, for instance. 
Yes, absolutely. And you are correct. Uh, this part of Eastern Canada and the St. John in particular has some of the longest uh, settlement, Euro-Canadian settlement history in, in the country and North America for that matter. And uh, as a result, it, the system does face some significant threats. Uh, we re released an updated version of watershed reports uh, last fall, which covers the St. John and, and many watersheds across the country, and generally found that the water quality here is is good, which is, um, you know, that's something, that's a positive <laughs> news story and, and something we should be talking about. That's not to say it's perfect. There's still uh, work to be done, but the system does face some very significant threats. And, you know, the top ones for me are, are habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Uh, pollution is a is a big one. There are many many uses um, for the river, or I should say, the river is used in in many ways um, on the on the water side, and that has some significant negative uh, impacts. And uh, last but not least is is obviously climate change. Uh, we are experiencing that right now, and and that is leading to some significant impacts uh, for the water through. For example, ex excessive flooding in, in the spring of 2018 and 2019, we had some of the highest floods ever. Uh, coincidentally, uh, last summer, we also had the driest summer since about 1924, uh, which also has some negative impacts for the river. So lots of challenges ahead, um, lots of opportunities to uh, improve on, on this. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, to be a part of it um, now and, and moving forward. I like that you're ending with opportunities, not just the challenges. Um, but let's try to end on a positive note since I just asked you about threats. So you may not be prepared for this, but what is your absolute favorite thing about the Willistook or perhaps favorite thing to do in the region? <laughs> oh, there's a lot of favorite things. Um, <laughs> You know, for for me, it's the opportunity to um, get out on on the water, in the water, and and be around the water, and that couldn't be any more true than it has been for uh, the past year. Um, you know, COVID has had some significant impacts in this region and and across the country and elsewhere, and we are realizing now more than ever the importance of being connected uh, to nature. And we're very fortunate here in New Brunswick that we can do that. A lot of people can walk right out their door um, and, and be in nature or within you know five or ten minutes be in nature and um, that has really helped uh, me and uh, maintain my sanity um, and <laughs> <Me too. laughs> also just uh, you know to relax the the, the feeling of being in nature is um, there's something that we're really fortunate to uh, to be able to do Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Simon. Um, and you obviously touched on a couple of species when you were describing the region. So I think it makes sense to throw it over to our resident species specialist, Emily Giles, who can chat about some of the local wildlife. Thanks, Simon. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, Emily. Thanks for joining us to talk about some wildlife, your favorite thing. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Yes, you know, you know that I'm always happy to come on and talk about wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> to kick it off, did you want to tell us a little bit about some of the species at risk within the region? Yes, absolutely. So um, the St. John River watershed is actually home to more than 50 species at risk. It's it's a really biodiverse region. There's, there's a ton of wildlife that live there. Um, but, but sadly, it's also home to a lot of species at risk. So some of the species at risk you've probably heard about, I'm sure you've seen them all the time. Um, so we're talking about things like uh, the Atlantic salmon, um, painted turtle, monarch butterflies, um, bald eagles. Those are some of the, the species at risk there. Um, there's also some really exotic and cool sounding uh, wildlife in the region too. So um, things that people probably haven't heard about before, like the, the southern tway blade orchid, um, the northern myotis bat, or the pygmy, pygmy snake tail butterfly, excuse me. There it is there on the screen. Well, it doesn't surprise me that you scrambled that word a bit because these are all tongue twisters. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are definitely there, are. They sure are. Are there any species that, um, maybe that we know a little better and are easier to say that you want to highlight today? Yeah, definitely. There are actually three um, really cool ones that I wanted to mention specifically. And the reason that I wanted to highlight them is because they are actually only found in St. John River watershed 
of Canada and nowhere else. Um, so just wanted to highlight them because uh, they are of course at risk of extinction and because they're only found there, that makes them even more vulnerable. So the first one is, is there up on the screen, um, that's the short nosed sturgeon. So anyone that knows me knows I think sturgeon are one of the most fascinating groups of fish, group of fish um, around the world, they're, they're in decline. And the, the short nosed sturgeon in, in the SJR is, is also in decline. The thing that is so neat about sturgeon is it can live for a really long time and they, they grow up to an absolutely enormous size. So uh, the, the oldest known short nosed sturgeon was, was recorded at 67 years old. Um, so it's just mind blowing that a, a fresh freshwater fish could live that long. Um, and the largest fish was recorded at, at 23.6 kilograms. So just absolutely massive. Ooh. And just to jump in, um, the short nosed sturgeon is actually one of the overwintering locations. It's actually just like a stone's throw from my house right now. So I live on the corner of the Hammond River and the Kennebecasis, and that's one of the known overwintering locations. So. I've oh, seen cool. one or two in my day. <laughs> oh, wow. So you've, you've actually seen them in the wild. I, I, I actually, I haven't seen them in the wild. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm jealous that you've seen them. And, and part of the reason that they are considered at risk is because they have such a limited distribution in right. Canada. So that makes them, them even more vulnerable. Uh, the other one that I wanted to talk about is actually a plant. It's not very often that we, we highlight plants, but um, there is a, a unique plant found in the region called the Furbish's lousewort. And there's, there's a photo of it there coming up on screen. Um, it only grows along this one river and it isn't actually closely related to, to anything else in Eastern North America. So it's therefore considered one of the most, most interesting plants in New Brunswick. Um, and sadly, recent surveys have been unsuccessful at, at finding the Furbish's lousewort. Um, so it shows that they really are at immediate risk of, of being lost to the province and, and therefore all of Canada as well. Right. I actually learned this week from Simon, actually. <laughs> um, he told me that they were under extreme pressure, especially because of some of those floods you just mentioned in 2018 and 2019, just really exacerbating the, the at-risk um, quality of the species. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's sad but true that, that uh, you know, a lot of these, these species are kind of um, uh, on the brink, as it were. Yeah. Um, and then there's one final species that I wanted to talk about. Again, something that's that's rare for us to, to highlight, but this is a beetle um, called the cobblestone tiger beetle. Uh, and again, in Canada, this cobblestone tiger beetle is only found within the St. John River watershed and only within um, eight small sites within the watershed itself. So it has very limited distribution. Um, I, I was actually thinking, based on the name, you'd think there'd almost be stripes or something on it to be like a tiger, but not quite, <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, a good, it's a good point. You're, you're probably wondering where it gets its name from. Um, it, it gets its name from the fact that it, it hunts like a tiger. So it's, oh, okay. it's, that's more where it comes from as opposed to appearance. So it, it can chase down its prey at really, really short, incredible um, bursts of speed. And then it also gets its name from, from the habitat where it's found uh, cobblestone beaches, of course. So the cobblestone tiger beetle. Cool. So yeah, I wanted to highlight those three because they are what we call endemic species, meaning they're only found to the, in that one region. Um, and because they're only found there, it's really, really, really important that we protect them and also try and recover them, increase their population size so that um, the populations are, are healthy once again. Uh, but the good news is, is we recently did a study, which we're, we're digging into here today, called the Priority Threat Management Study. And uh, we, we found that all three of these species can be recovered if we implement um, some really important strategies in the region. So you've actually, you've, uh, we've been alluding to this study since the beginning, so we have a name for it now, Priority Threat Management. Um, so Emily is going to dig into exactly what that even means uh, with our next guest, Dr. Abby Kamaklang, who's a postdoctoral fellow from the University of British Columbia. So off to you, Emily. <laughs> Oh, hi, Abby. Hi, Emily. 
I know it's I know it's early out there for you today in in BC. So thank you so much for joining in the morning for you. <laughs> yeah, 9 a.m. That's okay. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm also so happy that that you're here because uh, you're the one that that crunched all the numbers and did all the the nitty gritty work behind this report that we're talking about. So I'm really happy that you're here to help explain it to, to folks who've probably never heard about party threat management before and, and don't really know what it is that we're talking about. So I'm wondering if we can just start by um, perhaps you can tell the audience a little bit about what priority threat management is and, and why it's an important tool for us in conservation. For sure. Um, so priority threat management, or what we call PTM for short, it's really just a step by step process to help us identify what conservation or management actions we can take to help save the most species or the most ecosystems in the in a region as possible, given the resources that we have available. So it takes a regional perspective by considering all the threats to the different species or ecosystems and identifying what actions can benefit many of those species. So this means PTM can be a faster and it's a more efficient planning process than doing recovery planning for each species individually. Right, okay, so I think um, what you're saying and, and what I understand is that it's different in its approach because instead of just working to protect one species, we're actually looking at um, prioritizing the actions or the strategies that are gonna help the most number of species. Exactly. So, Okay, so I know obviously you and, and um, your, your colleague, Dr. Tara Martin at, at UBC led this work. Um, who else was involved in the work? Well, in the PTM, what we actually do is we work directly with um, all the people that are involved in doing research and conservation, on the ground conservation work in the region to get the information that we need for the analysis. So this includes identifying, first of all, which species are of conservation concern that we want to focus on. Um, what are the different actions or strategies that we want to take or we want to consider taking to manage those different species or their threats? And how likely is it that those different strategies can be implemented successfully? And we also take into account um, how much it might cost to implement those strategies. And most importantly, how much those strategies will benefit all the different species in the region. And that's the information that we use to determine which set of actions will save the most species for the least cost. Um, so in other words, which ones can get us the most conservation benefit for our money? And that's important because as Jessica mentioned earlier, there's usually not enough money for conservation. So we need to make sure that we're as efficient and as effective as possible in spending it. Right. Yes, that's that's an excellent point. Um, I know that yeah, as conservationists, it's often um, difficult for us to, to be talking about costs, but um, it is it is, of course, a practical way to be looking at it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note, too, is that we were, of course, collecting data. We, we got people together during workshops. Um, but luckily, we were able to do all of that before COVID uh, set in. So we were actually able to be all together and, and do that in person. Um, so, so that was one great thing about the, the last couple of years. Um, and then it was you, of course, that, that took all the data and actually crunched the numbers. You did, you did a lot of the heavy lifting there. So after we crunched the numbers, what were the, what were the big results? What did we find? Well, I did have a lot of help and especially the experts who participated in our process. So thank you to, to all of you, uh, for getting us the data. Um, so based on all the expert data and all the empirical data that we found, um, we saw that, well, if we didn't do anything, at least anything more than what we're already doing now, none of the species um, that we were looking at have a very good chance of still being around over 25 years. But the good news is that we can change this by implementing the management strategies that the experts developed in the PTM process. So if we want to save the most species in the region, we found that we would need to implement strategy 23, which is that top one there that you see on the graph or in the graphic. Um, and that's a combination of 15 different management strategies. So basically all the strategies that the experts came up with in the PTM process. So this will benefit um, 39 species that are of conservation concern in the region, as well as the Appalachian hardwood, hardwood forest community. Um, and the different, the, all the, thir the 39 species that it will secure includes species such as the Atlantic salmon and the short-nosed sturgeon that you talked about earlier. And that will cost about 
25.8 million per year over the 25 year period, which works out to about $33 per New Brunswick per year. But say that we'd, so if we didn't have that kind of money, um, we can still help save some species by implementing a few of the more cost effective strategies. For example, um, implementing three strategies that focus on the management of public forestry and private land. So that's um, the lowest um, strategy that you saw on the graphic there. Um, that can help 29 species, as well as the Appalachian hardwood forest community. Um, if we had more money, we can implement four additional strategies that focus on management of wetland, riparian, and aquatic habitats, and that can help an additional four species. Great. So I think, um, you know, even though that, that first result that you mentioned there is quite sobering and that if, if we just continue um, with our current plan as is in the watershed, that, that species are, are not likely to recover, that's, that's quite, quite sobering. But uh, our results also showed clearly that, um, you know, it's great news that, that species at risk in the watershed can be recovered. So uh, knowing that, though, we know that it's no, no small feat. Um, you talked about quite a few strategies there that need to be done. So, so what do you think then needs to really happen next? Well, what really needs to happen next is we need to start implementing these strategies. Um, so... Like I mentioned, ideally we want to implement all of the strategies on the list, that um, 15 strategies, if our goal is to save as many species as we can. But if we, since we don't often have enough money um, or the resources to do everything, we can start off with some of the cheaper strategies I mentioned. So investing in the land management strategies first um, and then adding the wetland and aquatic habitat strategies when we have more funding. And the great thing about having this action plan, this, this list of priority strategies, um, is that it allows all the different groups that are doing conservation work in the region to target their efforts and pool their resources together to implement the priority strategies and get the most benefit for species. Yeah, it's great. And I think um, what you're saying is, is absolutely true. And, and sadly, conservation sometimes falls short of the implementation phase. We often develop these plans, uh, but then they don't actually get put into action. So we really wanted to see this project through from, from beginning to end. And thankfully, uh, at WWF, we have funding from Fisheries and Oceans Canada to actually start to fund and implement some of these actions that we discovered through the PTM process. So I'm actually going to throw it back over to Jessica, who's um, going to share with us about uh, some one of the projects that she was lucky enough to get out in the field and visit this summer um, and, and share a little bit about that work. So thank you so much, Abby, for, for joining us. And now back over to you, Jessica. Hi, Ben. How's it going? Hi, Jess. It's going well, thanks. Uh, ben Whalen is here, and he's a project manager for the Kennebecasis Watershed Restoration Committee. And he's going to tell us about some of the work that he implemented this past fall that was part of the PTM process, but that was identified throughout the project. So, Ben, do you want to tell us a little bit about that project, specifically the one that I helped <laughs> with in Pasake Creek? Yeah, sure, Jess. It'd be my pleasure. Thanks for having us on your feet today. Um, so I guess the KWRC, through a lot of past historical work, identified uh, elevated stream temperatures and degraded riparian zones or degraded stream banks as being some of the key limiting factors to the overall health of our watershed. So we wanted to go to work at, you know, restoring some riparian habitats and planting trees and that kind of thing. And in 2020, we got together with WWF and the partners and some other partners across our watershed, including ACAP, St. John, and, and uh, the National Rock Watershed, and we started to put together a plan to get, you know, tap in with WWF to do some of that work. And that included, you know, restoring over 900 meters of riparian zone, uh, planting over 2,000 trees along that degraded riparian zone, stabilizing three severely eroding stream banks of over 120, which had a total distance of over 120 meters. And you can see some of that, I think, in the background there now. Uh, so we also do this by engaging a lot of volunteers. and. Of course, 2020 being what it was with the pandemic, we were still able to accomplish all of this work and overcome those pandemic challenges. So that was really important. And the work as well doesn't just help 
you know those species at risk it also helps the farmers create a more sustainable farm system for them so they can better plan for their future and how they can plan and work around that river that's important to not just the fish and, and, the, and the aquatic species but to all the other people too along the waterway definitely so multiple co-benefits really of all of that work it sure is um, so I, I felt like it was fun to get out into the uh, field and get my boots dirty. I think from my intro, people can get the sense that I'm predominantly behind a computer most of the day. Um, but in terms of the PTM process itself, it obviously focused quite significantly on wildlife. Emily mentioned a lot of different species. So can you tell us a little bit about how the project that you implemented will help some of those species like sturgeon or salmon in the region? For sure. So the Canby case, we're pretty fortunate. There's over 20 species of fish. Like I think there's 23 to 26 species of oh, fish wow. in the long time that utilize our river, uh, including, you know, the, the short-nosed sturgeon, uh, which is, you know, some of the last breeding habitat of the short-nosed sturgeon is on the Canby cases. As you alluded to earlier, it's right out your front door almost. Yeah. And then we also have this Atlantic salmon and a number of other valid recreational species as well. And when we get a degraded riparian or degraded riparian zone or, or an eroding stream bank, it's introducing sediments and nutrients and allowing the sun to easily right. penetrate into that water course. Uh, you end up with a lot of you know negative conditions for those fish species to be able to thrive and, and succeed long term. Uh, so with the work that we do by like stabilizing the stream banks and planting the trees, it helps keep the shoreline intact, reduces the sediment and erosion, uh, reduces the overall uh, introduction of nutrients and you know, you saw that we're working in a lot of farm fields and agricultural areas, uh, and you want to keep some of their nutrients out of the stream as well. Definitely. And that's important uh, because when those sediments and all those excess nutrients in the stream temperatures elevate, our fish species don't breed, they don't uh, succeed near as well as what they should, and they can't even compete as well as some of the invasive species that are starting to make their presence known in our watershed as well. Uh, a lot of them are a little bit more resilient to those higher temperatures. So the work that we do helps protect and, and keep those habitats better for our native stock. Right, so just to reiterate, um, I know there's lots of different people watching and my mom's probably watching. So just to make it clear for her, uh, when we plant a tree beside a riparian zone, we help to provide shade for that stream. And the shade is important for keeping that temperature cool, essentially, so that the fish can thrive. And at the same time, the tree also sequesters in carbon or takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which helps to mitigate climate change. So there are lots of different benefits from all of this work. Uh, so last question for you before I let you off the hook for the day. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the term resilient habitat and kind of the linkages between climate change and biodiversity as it relates to some of your work? Sure, so for us, what a resilient habitat is, it's one that can, it can rebound from threats or issues that it, that are taking place on it, whether it's a, a fire, you know, destroy some of the riparian zone or some of the forest next to our, our rivers and streams, or whether it's, uh, you know, an invasive species pest that's knocking out a certain one individual plant species. Uh, and, and I think one of your guests were asking about that earlier on, on the comments right. I noted. So, you know, we're, it, it's not, uh, by creating a, a, um, a resilient habitat, it's one that will continue to rebound back and have species that can, you know, if one falters, another one can step up and take its place and continue to thrive long term. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's we're putting a plan in place that just helps everybody continue to make the best off that landscape. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Ben, and thanks for educating our audience on some of the wonderful work that's been going on here. Thanks, um, all right. Thanks so much. And uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit into some Q&A. So hopefully we'll get Simon back up here to help me out with that. All right, Simon, are you ready for some questions in the hot seat? Yes, and I'm envious of the footage of the river during what obviously was the summer, or maybe fall. It's uh, hopefully it'll get here soon. <laughs> it was the fall. Uh, thankfully, the, the COVID restrictions weren't too bad, so we did get to go out and do lots of restoration work. Yep. All right, so let's dig in here. So I have one question from Kristen, who's wondering if the 
50 species at risk that Emily was discussing for the region. Um, do those include ones that have been assessed by Kasiwik? Yes, in fact, it does. Um, and it was a combination of those species that are listed and those um, species that have been assessed. Okay, perfect. Hopefully that answers that for you, Kristen. And I have another question here that's Someone's excited about talking about plants. Um, a couple people actually. And we're wondering what's happening with some tree species in the area. We know that trees in other provinces such as Quebec um, aren't doing so great right now. So what's the status there? So I think this question was actually in reference to the ash trees and we have um, two predominant ash species here, white ash um, and black ash. Black ash, interestingly, has some very, uh, has a cultural significance uh, to the Woolastukwik. That's the ash tree that grows on wetter sites and um, is used for uh, basket making, which then can be used to uh, collect fiddleheads and all of that good stuff. Um, but the, the it's emerald ash borer, um, which is the uh, invasive insect, and it is decimating uh, ash trees throughout Southern Ontario and Quebec. And we are starting to uh, see it here now, and particularly along the valleys, we see a lot of, of ash trees. And that species is, is a critical component um, of uh, Appalachian hardwood forest. It's one of the indicator tree species uh, for that unique forest type, which is located in the valley area. Really, anybody familiar with the Meduxta Keg River Association and their work would know um, about Appalachian hardwood forest. And um, unfortunately, the future isn't uh, overly positive for that tree species. And, and this isn't anything new. We've seen this with um, Dutch elm disease. We've seen it with um, butternut canker and certainly climate change is exasperating the situation for uh, the ashes and a number of other tree and plant species. All right. Well, I want to do some tree planting on my property this summer. So I know I'm going to hit you up to <laughs> determine what would be the best things to plant. Yep. Um, we have another question here that's about the PTM process. So wondering if that process is actually happening in other places. Has it only happened in the St. John River or is it happening elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. So we're probably about the third group uh, across the country to implement uh, priority threat management. Uh, one of the first areas was the was the Lower Fraser in British Columbia and then the south of Divide. So prairie region essentially. What I would note is that we are the um, first project to move through the PTM process and get to implementation. Um, and we move very quickly on this. Uh, you know, it is a it is really a rapid assessment yeah. uh, utilizing expert elicitation and, and other knowledge. And it was um, something that uh, came to us through our science and innovation forum uh, back in 2018. And here we are, you just heard it right straight from Ben, uh, his work in ACAP St. John and the Nashwalk Watershed Association uh, implemented restoration projects uh, over this past summer. And obviously, just so we're clear, um, adhered to uh, COVID requirements in the region as they did so. Yeah, and it's nice to see the boots on the ground. I know so so often we do a lot of these kind of decision frameworks and we're trying to plan, do a lot of conservation work, but getting the boots on the ground is kind of the exciting part uh, to making a difference. I, I absolutely agree. And it's part of an adaptive management uh, approach. We so often take undertake planning exercises and they are important pieces of work right. to do, yeah. open standards, conservation and all of that good stuff. Um, but we are at this point in time, we need to combat the dual crisis of, of climate change and biodiversity loss and come to understand that sometimes we'll make some mistakes and we don't have all the answers, but uh, it's more important to be doing at this point in time, uh, hopefully improving the situation, learning from mistakes uh, and adapting as we move forward. Great. All right. So just moving through some other comments here. Um, Sierra is wondering if there's volunteer opportunities to help in New Brunswick this summer. So Sierra, I don't know if we have that information on us now, but feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with the proper folks at the organization um, about those opportunities. And we have another question here about how can people in New Brunswick help wildlife? Everyone wants to kind of make a difference. So what can we do? We have time on our hands with COVID. <laughs> Yeah, well, absolutely want to encourage that. And there's a 
couple of things that we can do here. First, I would say we need to protect what we have. Um, we are right. very fortunate in in New Brunswick to have a, such a diversity of, of species and, and landscapes and habitats. And the province is on the right track we, to protecting 70, 17% of, of habitats and, and special places. And so that's, that's important. Let's protect what we've got. And that helps us with, uh, again, the dual crisis of biodiversity loss and, and climate change. Um, over and above that, we need to be undertaking restoration work, just like Ben um, spoke about, and finding those sites that are contributing significant nutrient sediment uh, and would benefit from some restoration. Planting silver maple floodplain, replanting silver maple floodplain forests, huge opportunity, and, and the, something that the Nashwalk Watershed Association is is undertaking. Maintaining vegetated shorelines and or revegetating your shoreline at the cottage um, is another good thing to be uh, to be doing. And lastly, I would say plant a native garden. Um, you know, doesn't matter if you have just a, a balcony space or you have acres of, of ground, um, you know, plant plant native species, which will uh, attract the pollinators, uh, attract the birds and uh, contribute to a healthy and resilient uh, habitat right, right in your backyard or front yard, door yard, whatever it may be. That's what I plan on doing this summer. And I actually last summer started removing some invasive species. I sent a, a picture of our property to someone at WWF and they went, oh no, there's an invasive species. So I there got the shovel out those, and got uh, on it. <laughs> yeah, there are a few of those around here and, and that is also part of the solution. We, we do need to scale that work um, throughout the watershed and, and the province as a, uh, as a whole. My one comment to people about um, planting is uh, probably a good idea to uh, get on and order your seeds um, yes. if you need to do so as soon as possible. There was a bit of a shortage uh, last year because everybody is starting to realize the importance of being connected to, uh, to the outdoors and, and to nature. Yeah, not a bad thing. It's nice to see. Nope. All right. So next question, um, if you could just reiterate, we did talk about this a little bit, but the main threats that have been identified for the region. Yeah, so a couple of significant threats, um, you know, this comes out of our watershed reports assessment, but also other work happening in the region. Uh, habitat loss, uh, habitat degradation, uh, habitat fragmentation. The, the Woolastook is a highly fragmented system. There are over 200 uh, impoundments or dams throughout this system, and that inhibits the movement of, of fish species, of nutrients, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, I would add pollution to the list, uh, and finally, climate change, which is just affecting everything, everywhere, uh, on an ongoing basis. Definitely. All right, so another one here from Marika, and she was wondering, what are the major limitations you have encountered with PTM? Yeah, Anything well- Anything uh, off the top of your head? <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it is a rapid assessment, and, um, but it does rely on uh, expert elicitation and, and getting yes. the experts into a room yeah. uh, for multiple days at a time is uh, is difficult. Um, and unfortunately, we were able to do this uh, ahead of uh, COVID's arrival. Um, but we may, you know, future PTM projects may have to uh, adapt to that. We were fortunate that the folks that are involved with us donated their their time and energy, and and even outside of those workshops, uh, reviewed materials and continued to provide uh, expert advice and and research and all of that good stuff. So that's no small feat, um, and it takes it takes a lot of work. We've got a large watershed here at you know fifty five thousand square kilometers. It's it's larger than Switzerland, so. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, the discussion around costs can yeah. be, can be difficult. Um, you know, what does it cost to recover a species based on a certain series of activities and our, our costs are often based on the existing understanding of activities that we have undertaken. And yeah. we, it is hard to think out of the box and, and think about those innovative solutions and then even more difficult to uh, layer on the costs on top of that to, um, um, come up with, the uh, with you know the outcome uh, that that is needed, definitely. And I do want to circle back um, on one of the questions that was looking at volunteer opportunities. So I do want to say um, you saw some of the project work that was happening, and that wasn't 
necessarily WWF, that was the Kenema Cases Watershed Restoration Committee. So you can also reach out to those organizations, um, ACAP St. John's, another one, the National Walk Watershed Association. So feel free to reach out to some of those organizations as they know they're always looking for people to help out. Um, I'm probably not the best suited to go out and be planting trees, so I'm sure uh, they'll love your expertise. Um, just checking here if there's anything else. All right, one last question for you, Simon. Over how many years is the PTM action plan expected to be implemented? Well, as we were working up the uh, feasibilities around this uh, and talking about uh, costs, we were looking at a at a twenty five year time frame. That's that was sort of the bounds that yeah. we uh, that we put on the the project. Uh, hopefully you know, the implementation is, is an ongoing task. Um, and the more we can do, the sooner the better, uh, essentially. So I have no doubt that this will be a, a lifetime uh, activity up and down the watershed as, as we restore its health and the habitats and, and the species that rely upon them. Uh, but also, really, we need to hit the ground running and, and the sooner and the more and the faster, the better, uh, essentially. So you know, we worked on a 25 year time horizon, but uh, the work really needs to start. Well, it did, it started last summer and we're gonna continue on it. We're certainly gonna encourage others, including um, the provincial government, uh, watershed groups and, and other NGOs and industry and business and communities and municipalities and individuals all have a, have a role to play here, um, helping this system to be healthy and, and resilient. Agreed. Couldn't agree more. Thanks, Simon, for helping me answer some questions. My I don't pleasure. know if I answered some... any. I put them all on you. But <laughs> no, those were some some really great questions, and I'm pleased that uh, the people who are engaging uh, with us on this work. We're very excited about it, and uh, we had some wonderful partners that helped make it happen. Definitely. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning into this special live episode that was dedicated to the St. John River watershed today. The work that you heard about today uh, was supported and funded by Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the Patrick and Barbara Keenan Foundation, and the Hewitt Foundation. And we look forward to continuing to conserve and uh, restore this wonderful ecosystem. So thanks everyone. Have a great day.